I'm Mohsen Reza Zadeh. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Sfahan. Instructional Phonetics and Phonology. This is session 11. English words and sentences. The second part. Overview. In the previous session, we discussed words in speech, citation form, and connected speech. Citation form is the form of a word when you say it by itself. There is at least one stressed syllable and no reduced vowel. Uh, connected speech. Words in a sentence in which there is several stressed syllables and reduced vowels. We also talked about some rules. Uh, for example, we said that um, there is a difference between pronunciation of a demonstrative pronoun that and conjunction that. When it is demonstrative, we use a strong form. When it is a conjunction, we use uh, the weak form. Um, we also discussed causes of assimilation. Uh, we said that we have two major causes. One of them is anticipatory co-articulation, which is on the next sound, and the other one is perseverative assimilation, which is on the previous sound. We also um, mentioned uh, some um, concepts related to stress. We said that um, a stress syllable is usually produced by pushing more air out of the lungs in one syllable relative to others. That is, a stress syllable has greater respiratory energy than neighboring unstressed syllables. Degrees of stress. In large words, usually there is more than one stressed syllable. In some longer words, uh, it may seem as if there is more than one stressed syllable. For example, say the word uh, multiplication and try to tap on the stressed syllables. You will find that you can tap on the first and the fourth syllables. Multiply on M multiplication multiplication on the first and the fourth syllables the fourth syllable seems to have a higher degree of stress the same is true of uh, other long words such as uh, magnification or psycholinguistics but this apparently higher degree of stress on the um, latter syllable occurs only when the word is said in isolation or at the end of a phrase so uh, this higher degree of stress on the fourth syllable this occurs only when the word is said in isolation or at the end of a phrase. Try saying a sentence such as um, the psycholinguistics course was fun. If you tap on each stressed syllable, you will find that there is no difference between the first and the fourth syllables of psycholinguistics. Uh, let me tap on each stress syllable. Psycholinguistic course was fun. If you have a higher degree of stress on the fourth uh, syllable in psycholinguistics, this word will be given special emphasis, as though you were contrasting some other psychology course with a psycholinguistic course. The same is true for the word magnification in a sentence such as the degree of magnification depends on the lens. The word magnification will not have a larger um, stress on the fourth syllable as long as you do not break the sentence into two parts and leave this word at the end of a phrase. Uh, now, here's the question. Why are uh, there are two degrees of stress in a word when it occurs at the end of a phrase or when it is alone?
The answer is that uh, in these circumstances, another factor is present. As uh, we will see in the next section, the last stressed syllable in a phrase often accompanies a special peak in the intonation. This is the tonic accent. In longer words containing two stresses, the apparent difference in the levels of first and the second stress is really due to the superimposition of an intonation pattern. When these words occur within a sentence in a position where the word does not uh, receive tonic accent, then there are no differences in the stress levels. Three syllable words exemplifying the difference between an unreduced vowel in the final syllable and a reduced vowel in the final syllable, first column and uh, second column. Uh, the words in both columns have the stress on the first syllable. The words in the first column might seem to have a second weaker stress on the last syllable as well, but this is not so. The words in the first column differ from those in the second column by having a full vowel in the final syllable. For example, we say uh, multiply, multiply, multiple regulate, regular, copulate, copular, circulate, circular, criticize, critical, minimize, minimal. In fact, the words in the first column differ from those in the second column by having a full vowel in the final syllable. This vowel is always longer than the reduced vowel in the final syllable of the words in the second column. The result is that there is a difference in the rhythm of the two sets of words. This is due to a difference in the vowels that are present. It is not a difference uh, in stress. There is not a strong increase in respiratory activity on the last syllable of the words in the first column. Both sets of words have increases in respiratory activity only on the first syllable. In summary, we can note that the syllables in an utterance vary in their degrees of prominence, but these variations are not all associated with what we want to call stress. A syllable may be specially prominent because it accompanies the final peak in the intonation. We will say that uh, syllables of this kind have a tonic accent. Given this, we can note that English syllables are either stressed or unstressed. If they are stressed, they may or may not be the tonic stress syllables that carry the major pitch changes in the phrase. If they are unstressed, again, they may or may not have a reduced vowel. These relationships are shown in this diagram. We need to understanding the difference between these processes. Consider the set of words explain, explanation, exploit, and exploitation. If each of these words is said in its citation form as a separate tone group, and the set will be pronounced like this. Explain, explanation, exploit, exploitation. Now, another way of representing some of these uh, same facts is shown in this table. This table shows just the presence, shown by plus, or absence, shown by minus of an intonation peak or a tonic accent 
a stress and a full vowel in each syllable in these four words. So this table shows the presence or absence of an intonation peak, a stress and a full vowel. Considering the first um, considering uh, the stress in the middle row, note that the two syllable words are marked plus stress on the second syllable and the four syllable words are marked plus stress on both the first and the third syllables for example explain explain is a two syllable word so you can see that the, um, it is marked plus a stress on the second syllable, explain on the second syllable. But um, explanation, explanation is uh, a four syllable word. So it is marked plus stress on both the first X, the first and the third syllable explanation and plus a stress on the third syllables. As you can see by comparing the middle row with the top row, the last plus stress syllable in each word has been marked plus tonic accent too. There is a plus in the third row if the vowel is not reduced. For example, um, for the first word explain, you can see plus for a in lane. Why? Because it is not reduced. But you can see minus uh, for X because E is reduced here in explain. Note that the difference in written between explanation and exploitation is that the second syllable of explanation has a reduced vowel, but this syllable in exploitation has a full vowel. This is this, the, this is the difference between the two. Um, as we saw in the previous uh, sessions, there are a number of words that do not occur in reduced syllables. Also, the actual phonetic quality of the vowel in reduced syllable uh, varies considerably from one accent to another accent. Um, um, remember that some other books do not make the distinctions described here, maintaining instead that uh, there are several levels of stress in English. Um, in other books, it is mentioned that the greatest degree of stress is called uh, stress level 1. The next is stress level two, the next level three, and a lower level still is level four, and so on. Note that in this system, a smaller degree of stress has a larger number. That is when we say stress level one, this means uh, a larger uh, one. That is, for example, the greatest degree is called stress level one. And the a smaller degree of stress has a larger number. For example, level four is the smaller degree of stress. Sentence rhythm. Stress on words may be modified when they occur in a sentence. The most frequent modification is the dropping of some of the stresses. There is a stress on the first syllable of each of the words in this sentence, for example, Mary, younger, brother, wanted, 50, chocolate, peanuts. As you can see, there is a stress on the first syllable of each of the words when these words are said in isolation. But uh, there are normally fewer stresses when they occur in a sentence uh, such as uh, Mary's younger brother wanted 50 chocolate peanuts. You will probably find it quite natural to tap on the first syllables marked with a preceding stress mark. I mean the red mark. Mary's younger brother 
wanted 50 chocolate peanuts. Thus, the first syllables of younger, wanted, and chocolate are pronounced without stresses. But remember, remember that um, although they are pronounced without stresses, their um, full vowel qualities are preserved. The same kind of phenomena can be demonstrated with monosyllabic words. As a general rule, English does not have stresses too close together. Say this sentence, the big brown bear bit 10 white mice. Most people will say uh, this sentence like the one I just said. In fact, it sounds unnatural if you put a stress on every sound. For example, the big brown bear bit 10 white mice. See, it is unnatural. As a general rule, English does not have stresses too close together. Very often, stresses on alternate words are dropped in sentences uh, where they would otherwise come too near one another. So here you can see that um, stresses are not too close together. So this tendency to avoid having stresses too close together may cause the stress on a polysyllabic word to be on one syllable in one sentence and on another syllable in another sentence. Consider the word uh, clarinet in this sentence. He had a clarinet solo. And in this sentence, he plays the clarinet. As you see, uh, the stress on a polysyllabic word uh, here it can be on one syllable in the first sentence, uh, that is, on the first syllable in clarinet. Or on another syllable here, on the second syllable, clarinet, in the second sentence. The stress uh, is on the first or th the third syllable, depending on the position of the other stresses in the sentence. Similar shifts occur in phrases such as uh, Vice President Jones versus Jones, the Vice President, or numbers such as uh, 16 versus she's only 16. That, if you pay attention when you uh, start counting, for example, 14, 15, um, or for example, 16, when you are counting, it is on the first syllable. But sometimes, um, in phrases such as this, or in sentences such as this, she's only 16, uh, the stress is on um, uh, the other syllable. Try to read all these phrases with stresses as indicated and check that uh, it is natural to tap on the stress syllables. In English, stresses tend to occur at regular intervals. In this slide, I've provided a video on word stress rules in conversation. You can use your mouse and play this video clip.
intonation. What is intonation? Intonation is a pattern of pitch changes in a sentence. So the intonation of a sentence is its pattern of pitch changes. What is intonational phrase? Intonational phrase is part of a sentence over which a particular pattern extends. So the part of a sentence over which a particular pattern extends is called an intonational phrase. Listen to uh, the pitch of the voice while someone says a sentence. You will find that it is changing continuously. The difference between speaking and singing is that in singing, you hold a given note for a noticeable length of time and then jump to the pitch of the next note. But when one is speaking, uh, there are no steady state pitches. Throughout every syllable in a normal conversational utterance, the pitch is going up or down. Try talking with steady state pitches and then uh, try to notice how odd it sounds. In an international phrase, there is a single syllable that carries the major pitch change. This is called tonic accent. This is marked by an asterisk. The tonic accent usually occurs on the last stressed syllable. If you don't put any special focus on any of the words in the utterance. Look at these examples. In the first example, sentence number one, the first syllable of mayor has the tonic accent. And as you can see, this word is the last one with a large overall pitch change. There is a pitch peak on the stressed syllable no, indicating that this syllable also had an accent. Though the tonic accent on mayor is more prominent. The tonic accent usually occurs on the last stressed syllable in a tone group in uh, neutral intonation. But it may occur earlier. If some uh, word requires, for example, emphasis, um, if we want to emphasize that we know the new mayor, but not the old one, then we can put the tonic accent on new, as in this sentence. We know the new mayor. Here, um, there are no further accents after new. So here, um, if we want to emphasize that we know the new mayor, but not the old one, uh, we can put the tonic accent on new. We say, we know the new mayor, which means that we only know the new mayor, but not the old one. When there are two or more international phrases within an utterance, <laughs> The first one ends in a small rise, which is called continuation rise. It indicates there is more information to come from speaker. The break between two international phrases may be marked as in this sentence, sentence three, by a single vertical stroke. As you can see, there is a single vertical stroke between the two sentences. When we came in, then there is a single vertical stroke and afterwards we, have, we had dinner. The British um, English speaker uh, for this sentence signals that there is more to come by having a fall on the preposition in after came. When we came in, the last word in the phrase is in, followed by a marked continuation rise. 
the American speaker the, uh, here the American speaker does this by prolonging the word in which starts at the peak of the pitch counter and making a very large fall followed by a more slight continuation rise um, listen to this example when we came in we had dinner listen again when we came in we had dinner 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 um in fact in this way of showing uh, there is more to come which occurs quite frequently it is not that there is much of a continuation rise it's more that um, there is no sentence final fall note also that the British speaker put a high accent on when while the American speaker didn't remember that new information important information contrasting information they all usually um, get the tonic accent also remember that the comment of a sentence is more likely to get the tonic accent than its topic look at this example uh, the topic of a sentence, as I said, is less likely to receive the tonic accent than the comment that is made on that topic. Thus, if you were telling someone a number of facts about lions, you might say the sentence shown in this figure. Um, a lion is a mammal. The topic of the discussion is lions. And the comment on that topic is that a lion is a mammal. So the topic is discussion about lion. And the comment is that lion is a mammal. The two speakers in this sentence differ slightly in that the American English speaker puts accents on both lion and mammal. Listen to... Um, this sentence a lion is a mammal listen again a lion is a mammal a lion is a mammal now listen to the second speaker a lion is a mammal 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 now um, so the two speakers uh, differ slightly in that the American English speaker puts accents on both lion and mammal. Nevertheless, even for this speaker, uh, the tonic accent is the last accent of international phrase. For both speakers, this is on the last word, mammal. Making it clear that this is the comment the new information that is being given about an already noun topic. Falling counter happens in sentences and questions with WH words. Rising counter happens in questions requiring yes or no answers. Look at this example. Uh, rising counter is typical uh, in questions requiring the answer yes or no, as exemplified in this um, sentence. Will you mail me my money? Uh, listen to this again. Will you mail me my money? Will you mail me my money? Will you mail me my money? Here you can see the rising counter. Now, uh, here is another example. When will you mail me my money? Here we have falling counter because it is a WH question. Listen to this example as well. When will you mail me my money? Listen again. When will you mail me my money? Here we have falling counter. Now, can you um, fill this blank? A list of items 
uh, can also has blank intonation on each item but not the last one is it falling or rising when you are listing some items yes rising intonation so a list of items can also has rising intonation on each item but not the last one look at this figure you can see that uh, there is a list of four names now uh, listen to this example we knew Anna Lenny Mary and Nora listen again we knew Anna Lenny Mary and Nora um, as you can see the first three names in this list have much higher pitches on their second syllable and uh, the fourth name uh, which is Nora the last one falls at the end of the sentence two kinds of rising intonations one is when there is a large upward movement of pitch in yes no questions and the second one is when uh, there is a smaller upward movement um, this happens in the middle of sentences now look at this example number 12 and number 13 there is a slightly uh, rising intonation in the utterances in number 12 and number 13 yes and go on there are um, in fact these are the kinds of utterances one makes when listening to someone telling a story they are equivalent to I hear you please continue something like that in the center of this illustration are two vertical lines indicating the normal voice ranges um, of the two speakers uh, the British English speaker, the upper pair of graph, uses about half of his pitch range in these words. The American English speaker, that is the lower pair of graphs, uses a slightly wider range. Now look at the other graph, number 14, yes, and number 15, go on. If there is a larger rise in pitch, as illustrations 14 and 15, there is a change in meaning to something more like, did you say yes or did you say go on? The British English speaker uses more than 75% of his full range. And the American English speaker, that is the uh, lower pair of graph, the American English speaker uses an, an even greater range. It should be noted, however, that people are not entirely consistent in the way they use this difference in um, intonation. Now, uh, listen to uh, number 12, number 13, 14, and 15. Yes. This is number 12. Yes. It means, uh, please continue. Now, listen to number 13. Go on. Go on. Go on. This means, uh, please go on. Now, listen to number 14. Yes. Yes. This means, uh, did you really say yes? Now listen to number 15. Go on. Go on. Go on. This means, um, do you really want me to go on? When you are surprised, your sentence might have falling and rising intonation. Both rising and falling intonations can occur within the same tonic accent. 
If someone tells you something that surprises you, you might have a distinct fall rise on the tonic syllable, followed by a further rise on the remainder of the international phrase. Uh, in this example, number 16, both speakers follow this pattern. Listen to this sentence. Your mom will marry a liar? Your mom will marry a liar? We can sum up many differences in intonation by referring to the different ways in which a name can be said particularly if the name is long enough to show the pitch curve reasonably fully. Curves 20 through 24 show different pronunciations of the name Amelia. 20 is a simple statement equivalent to her name is Amelia. Now listen to this example, number 20. Amelia, Amelia, Amelia. Now listen to number 21. Amelia, Amelia, Amelia. Here uh, for 21, uh, 21 is the question equivalent to uh, did you say um, Amelia? Did you say Amelia? Uh, what about number 22? 22 is the form uh, with the continuation rise, which might be used when addressing Amelia, indicating that it is her turn, um, for example, to speak for 22. Now, listen to uh, number 22. Amelia. 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 So as you can see, this is the form with the continuation rise. Uh, what about number 23? Number 23 is a question uh, expressing surprise, equivalent to, was it really Amelia who did that? Now, listen to number uh, 23. Amelia? Amelia? Amelia. Amelia. So as you can see here, we have a question expressing surprise. Was it really Amelia who did that? What about the last one, number 24? Um, here, the last one, number 24, is the form of a strong reaction. Uh, listen to this example, number 24. Amelia, Amelia, Amelia. So as you can see, here we have a form of a strong reaction. So today we started our discussion uh, with degrees of stress. We said that we have two types of syllables, stressed, unstressed, and stress one we have tonic stress or non-tonic stress and for unstressed syllables we have um, reduced stressed and unreduced stressed and next we talked about sentence rhythm we said that uh, the uh, stress of one word may be modified when uh, that word occur in a sentence and finally, we talked about intonation. Uh, we said that intonation is the pattern of pitch changes in a sentence. We also said that intonational phrase is uh, the part of a sentence over which a particular pattern extends. Uh, this is the end of uh, session 11. Good luck.